All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. Whether you are a member of the Ford School community or coming here from across campus or beyond, welcome. Um, my name is Sarah Mills and I'm a lecturer here in the Ford School and also, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Woo. and also a project manager in Close Up, which is our Center for Local, State and Urban Policy. And today's event actually spans both of those roles because it's part of our Close Up in the Classroom initiative, which is trying to get students actively engaged in the work that we're doing, the research that we're doing in the center. As a result, some of those in the audience are in taking my class right now, Energy and Environmental Policy Research, which is a seminar for Ford School BAs. Um, but today's event is also the first in a series of close up, of, of a new series of close up activities that we'll be doing, highlighting exciting advancements in renewable energy policy. Um, in particular, in particular, sorry, um, we'll be highlighting policies and policy research that's at the sub-federal level, so at the state and local level. This series is made possible through the Ford School Renewable Energy Support Fund, um, which was uh, seeded by a generous donation from Dennis and Nancy Meany. And I also want to acknowledge the co-sponsors for today's event, which are the Energy Institute, Environmental Law and Policy Program, the Graham Sustainability Institute, the Program in the Environment, and the School for Environment and Sustainability. So for this first event um, in the Close Up Renewable Energy series, um, we're delighted to have Jeffrey Jaquette here, who is an assistant professor of rural sociology at Ohio State. Don't hold his, his uh, employer against him. Um, uh, where his research focuses on the local impacts of energy development. Uh, while I'd read his work before, I had an opportunity to first meet him this summer when he uh, co-organized and hosted in Columbus um, the first Energy Impacts Conference, which was an opportunity for social science researchers um, who were working on energy issues to meet and exchange ideas. Most of the folks there uh, were researching um, the impacts of and local policy responses to either wind energy development or fracking, and both of these are topics that Jeffrey's looked at extensively, and they also happen both to be topics that we've worked on in close up. Um, most of, much of Jeffrey's work has focused on the impact that energy development practices have on individuals living in communities with, for example, and what I think he'll talk a lot about today is wind turbines. Um, to some extent, these practices have been shaped by state and local policies, encouraging wind development in particular places or incentivizing the use of particular practices. But what I'm particularly intrigued by is Jeffrey's research, which shows that wind farms may, by their very scale, alter one of the traditional roles of government, which is to serve as a broker between the power plant operator and the community. I'm going to leave that to Jeffrey, though, to explain how that may be the case. And so please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Jaquette. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for the invitation uh, to be here. Uh, I think this is the point in the talk where I make a joke about football, um, <laughs> being from Ohio State. Um, but I actually grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up a Badgers fan, um, grew up uh, rooting for uh, University of Michigan and Ohio State to lose, so I guess maybe um, skip the football jokes. Um, uh, so I just wanted to just really uh, just briefly um, talk about sort of trends in wind and shale development. Um, I, from my perspective, wind and shale are really similar uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, <coughs> um, sort of, especially the development in the sort of relationship that they have with uh, local state government, regulatory policy, um, and sort of talk about sort of energy policy and the way that government and property owners play into that. And then just sort of talk about three uh, similar research projects uh, that sort of look at property owners and, and local government. And I think the property ownership thing is, is something I've really been interested in recently uh, with both wind and shale, um, you can't, uh, at least in the eastern U.S., in most parts of the U.S., uh, you can't do shale, you can't do wind unless you have a property owner willing to partner with you. Um, in most cases, more than just one property owner, you need, you need uh, a bunch. Um, 
So I think if you're in this room, you probably don't really need an introduction on uh, the energy transformations in the United States. Uh, just really quickly breeze through these. Uh, you know, new technologies, uh, increased price of energy, sort of new environmental uh, public policy priorities have resulted in lots of new energy happening in the United States, uh, lots of new locations of energy, lots of new different types of ownership of energy, um, and lots of new kind of impacts on environmental, social, economic resources uh, all across the country. Um, <coughs> Just uh, sort of a generic map of wind energy potential. Um, lots of uh, blue on the map. Um, and, you know, just, I guess, sort of maybe hold this image for later. Um, you know, lots, lots of uh, wind energy potential. And we've had lots of uh, wind energy development in the, in the past decade. Um, still continues to increase. I think we're we're getting close to 50,000 wind turbines in the United States. I think it's more install capacity anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, 82,000 megawatts. Uh, it continues to, to grow, at least in the next few years. Um, if you want to know where the wind turbines are, uh, there's a really cool map, um, sort of an interactive GIS uh, uh, <coughs> application. Uh, you can check it out, but these are, these are wind farms. Each dot is a wind farm made up of how many um, wind turbines and uh, a lot of wind development all over the country although you know the distribution of these these dots don't really seem to be sort of even um, some like clusters here of uh, of wind which is which is interesting to me and, and we'll return to that in sort of research project number three um, shale energy uh, similar story uh, lots of shale development happening all over the country. Um, this one, I mean, unlike, or I should say, uh, like wind, there's, you know, the resource is not necessarily evenly distributed. Um, but where there is, has been a lot of, uh, um, where there's a lot of shale resource, there's been a lot of development in, in most places. Maybe Michigan might be somewhat of, of an uh, <laughs> exception that there seems to be a lot of resource there, but not quite enough development or not a lot of development yet, um, but uh, we'll see how these other plays sort of uh, play out um, when it comes to Michigan's turn. Um, just looking at, you know, uh, oil supply in the United States is, uh, is um, growing. O oil demand in the United States is declining. Um, we've become, uh, I think, what, second in the world for um, oil production. Uh, projected to be, or sorry, third in the world oil production uh, projected to be second uh, pretty soon in the next few years. Um, there's lots of sort of charts that show oil production and uh, shale gas production and they both, you know, are, are growing pretty precipitously. Um, okay, so shapers of energy development. Just trying to like put together some, like a conceptual diagram of, of how um, energy, um, you know, sort of the, the, the institutions and the roles of different players in sort of shaping energy development. Of course, you have energy policy and regulation. Uh, in the United States, there's sort of three levels, uh, federal level, state level, local level. Uh, you have the energy industry itself, which is, you know, really complicated and depend, depending on if you're talking about wind or shale or, or another type of energy source. And then you have uh, private property owners. Um, and then you have all sorts of other stuff going on, like energy prices, uh, you know, the geology. Um, you have uh, transportation, um, transmission lines. You have uh, community attributes. You have um, all sorts of different things going on. Um, and it's a really complicated model, thinking about impacts from energy and the scope and scale of energy development. Uh, but just wanted to focus sort of on these, these three larger, uh, I guess, institutions, you might call them shaping energy, so we have uh, policy and regulation, the energy industry itself, and private property owners. And I guess I'm today at least talking about sort of the overlap between policy regulation and uh, private property owners. Um, so think about policy. At the federal level, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, federal policies have been uh, pretty um, pro-industry. Um, I think, you know, federal regulation towards shale has been largely sort of hands-off. Um, you know, shale industry can 
um, s sort of uh, do what it needs to do. Uh, regulation for shale has been largely left up to the states. Uh, in uh, federal regulation towards wind has been uh, primarily in the form of the production tax credit. Uh, production tax credit has been sort of digging in and sort of thinking about this is, is interesting because it's, um, you know, the way the tax credit is set up, it's really only an incentive for organizations that pay lots of taxes. Um, if you pay lots of taxes, then the production tax credit um, becomes really attractive to you. Um, but if you don't pay taxes, if you're a university, for example, or you're a nonprofit, or you're a municipality, or you're a church, or um, whatever it might be, or if you're an individual, or maybe a small group of individuals, um, you're probably not paying enough taxes to make the production tax credit worth it. Um, and so it really incentivizes wind in, uh, for really large corporate uh, you know, organizations, which are the, the organizations that are sort of best suited to take advantage of this incentive. Um, so we'll come back to that. Uh, at the state level, um, so s state, um, the, the federal government, uh, I think, has been sort of taking this hands-off approach. And meanwhile, the states have been exempting um, uh, regulation of oil and gas, which means that uh, s the states have been saying to local municipalities, uh, you don't have the authority to regulate oil and gas. That authority rests with us at the state level. Um, and what's interesting about wind is that wind is sort of moving in the same direction. There's been a lot of states that have, have moved to regulate wind energy in a similar way as, as oil and gas development with this preemption model. Um, in, the, you know, in the U.S. we have this sort of this legacy, this, this um, ideology of home rule of that municipalities can, can zone, can regulate the uh, activities that, that go on in their municipality. Um, you know, if you want to cite a car wash or a factory or, a, you know, a power plant or whatever it is, um, it has to go through sort of, you know, the state or s sorry, through the local municipalities, through the planning and zoning board. You have to have public meetings and hearings and so on. Uh, but with energy, with um, oil and gas and increasingly, increasingly with wind, um, don't have to do that at the local level. Um, the, the, the regulation is... is uh, preempted. And, you know, the rationale for that is, I think there's a number of rationales. Um, this idea of keeping uh, regulation uniform across the states. Uh, you don't have this patchwork of different municipalities allowing or not allowing energy. Um, there's this idea that local governments might not be um, best suited to regulate energy development. It's complex. It's um, highly technical. There's lots of environmental risk involved and so on. Um, and also it, you know, helps, it can help uh, uh, streamline the process for developers, arguably. Um, uh, uh, I think energy developers would pr presumably like to see, um, you know, energy development regulated uh, consistently across the state. Um, and it re sort of removes one layer of potential um, regulation or uh, one obstacle uh, towards development. Um, so local is not a, really a huge player. Um, it is for wind. It can be for wind. But uh, increasingly, at least at the national level, that um, has sort of been moving towards uh, preemption. Um, the state is heavily involved. Uh, the federal government, not as much. Um, but then you have uh, private property owners. Um, and I guess what I had mentioned before, um, getting the private property owners. So I think in the planning world, um, it's been a lot of research on the value of public participation, and public participation has become, I think, uh, in one of the sort of the biggest factors, uh, biggest uh, attributes, criterion for, for public planning, um, especially at the local level. Um, you need to get people involved. You need to have public participation sort of in multiple steps along the way. Uh, get people involved early, keep them involved, um, with the benefits being that, uh, I guess a number of benefits. One is that your planning process might be more effective. Uh, local people have, um, you know, sort of knowledge and might actually know what is best for your community. Um, but that also people tend to be happier with the outcome, um, knowing that they had opportunities to participate along the way. Um, <clears throat> and so they tend to be more accepting of of what it is that uh, is uh, that you know the result of the planning process. 
Uh, but <clears throat> with energy, um, especially with, with shale and also increasingly with wind, you don't have those opportunities to participate at the local level. Um, you know, people are sort of, there's, there tends not to be local planning and zoning meetings or local hearings on, on the issue. Um, and so you're t sort of taking away this, this uh, avenue for public participation, which at least in the planning world, there's lots of research showing that it's important. Um, so enter these uh, private landowners for, for wind and shale. Um, both you know, wind and shale, they have this sort of leasing system. Um, so you need this sort of large landscape of land uh, for either shale or for wind. Um, that large landscape will be owned by many different people, uh, sort of patchwork or tapestry of different landowners, and you need to get them all on board and actually sign uh, legal uh, you know, documents, um, sign leases um, with, with these landowners. Um, and so this uh, sort of offers this, uh, I guess, a different um, you know, avenue for different relationship between these large industries and um, the, the local communities where they're sited. Um, and so, you know, this, this, uh, this lease that wind farms and, and shale developers sign with the landowners, you know, they're legally binding agreements, uh, typically five or 10 years in duration if no energy is produced. Um, if energy is produced, then the lease is sort of held in perpetuity. Um, the lease, you know, dictates the lease payment for, for the acreage, and then it also dictates the royalty payments um, if it's developed. And so, you know, they, they're sort of regulatory instruments, but they're, you know, at the, at the landowner scale. Um, um, you know, and so they um, look like this, uh, actually look more like this. Um, and so I have all sorts of different clauses in there. Um, and what's interesting is, is the landowners, in theory, could negotiate for whatever they want. Um, they could negotiate for... Uh, environmental protections on their property, they could negotiate for uh, additional compensation, um, you know, they could negotiate for even wider benefits for the community if they're organized to do that. I think lots of times uh, what we see is, is landowners um, aren't necessarily negotiating for the full suite of uh, concessions that they might uh, be able to, um, you know, whether they sign what is offered to them by the, by the, by the energy company or maybe they'll get an attorney. Um, but, you know, it's, it's actually a very powerful, um, you know, it's sort of piece of regulation, but it's done at the, at the property owner scale. Um, but what's interesting is lease is not just royalty rates and it's not just um, lease payments, but um, it's actually, you know, involves a pretty sort of intimate, uh, lengthy discussion. Um, you know, you have a land, land man or land woman who might, you know, show up at your front door, it might um, talk to you at your kitchen table, might give you their personal cell phone number, um, email address, say, hey, if you have any problems, any questions, you know, call me, you know, send me a text, um, and they'll probably be really responsive to the landowner if they do indeed have questions. And, you know, it, thinking about this is that it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to p sort of participate in the planning of, uh, of, the, of the energy development. Except it's, you know, one-on-one -on -one participation. It's actually a really intimate um, type of participation that, that a lot of people uh, don't, you know, don't have the opportunity to, to engage in, whether it's in a public process or if they're, especially if they're not a landowner. Um, so this brings me to research, research project number one, uh, looking at um, landowner attitudes in northern Pennsylvania. Um, so we're looking at, you know, how do attitudes change? How do attitudes change if they're a landowner, if they have, if they have a lease, um, or if they have um, leasing and the actual development on their property? And uh, pick this site in northern Pennsylvania because there's a, a rather large wind farm that was being uh, constructed and also tons of uh, shale gas drilling going on in the same place. And so uh, this is in northern Pennsylvania. These uh, red circles are wind turbines and then the black sort of starry circles are shale wells. Um, and what we did is we did basically a census of all landowners in the green area and then sort of did a random uh, selection of landowners in, in the beige area. Uh, received a 58% response rate. Um, Got about a thousand surveys back. This is in uh, 2011. Um, so if they had no lease or development for the natural gas, uh, 
uh, tended to be much more pessimistic about um, energy development. Uh, if they had a lease only but no actual well drills, wells drilled, sorry, they um, tended to be sort of uh, ambivalent or of mixed minds. Um, but if they had the lease and the well on their property, they tended to be much more optimistic about, um, tended to have a much more positive attitude towards natural gas. Um, for the wind farm, um, the attitudes weren't quite as, as disparate, but sort of similar trends going on. Um, you know, if you had a lease, you tended to be more positive. If you had a lease and a wind turbine, you tended to be much more positive. And so, you know, what explains this? What's going on? Why do these, why do you sort of get progressively uh, higher levels, um, more positive attitudes? I think, you know, you could certainly point to the compensation. Um, this idea that, um, you know, so if they, if they have a lease, they're getting some money from the developer for the lease payments. If they have a lease and development, then they're getting uh, potentially significantly more money. Um, and so that might lead to positive attitudes. However, if we ask them, um, uh, how informed do you feel about the planning and siting process for the energy source? It turns out that um, for gas drilling, if they have a lease or they have a lease in a well, they, they are less likely to feel uninformed. Uh, same for the wind farm and much more likely to feel f informed or very in informed. Um, so it could be the money, but it could also be that they actually feel like they've been part of the planning process, which all our planning li literature seems to suggest is really important. Um, if you've been given enough op opportunity to participate, you can see that um, the no opportunity people are highest amongst no lease or well, no lease or turbine, and then um, the highest, uh, enough or more than enough opportunity tends to be highest amongst the lease in the well. Um, so if you do um, some multiple regression, um, so just having a lease and having a well um, explains some of the variation, but it turns out that this um, feeling informed opportunity for participation uh, explains more of the variation um, than just having, having that on your property. Um, same thing for, uh, for the wind farm, um, which um, at least there's a suggestion there that um, this sort of private participation, uh, this, this public, this uh, participation in the process, but the participation is occurring outside the public sphere, outside of sort of the local, um, you know, municipality. Um, you know, these, that these folks are sort of uh, participating and they're feeling informed and they're feeling like they, they're getting the benefits of participation, but it's private uh, through private negotiations. Um, and, you know, sort of, I guess, uh, raises all sorts of different questions um, with, uh, with the, you know, the rise of this idea of private participation. Um, only certain people are allowed to participate. It's not open to all. It's only open to, to landowners. And, um, and um, you know, it's occurring outside the public sphere. Um, and there's this lots of opportunities for landowners to negotiate for all sorts of things, but it doesn't necessarily appear that they are negotiating for all sorts of things, um, tend to be just negotiating for money or for uh, concessions on their personal property. Um, uh, there's, you know, the potential for it to be sort of exacerbating the has versus the have nots in these situations where you have these landowners or already landowners um, and already have at least, um, you know, some level of, of economic resources and um, tend, tend to be getting even more, whereas people who don't own land uh, can't participate in this process. Um, and there's been uh, some research th that other folks have done on sort of this idea of private participation. Uh, one in uh, Pennsylvania and New York, looking at people who leased and who um, had development on the property, sort of similar findings to what we found in our study that, um, you know, sort of the, the more interactions they had with the energy company, the more they feel like they uh, had participation. Um, this uh, ended up in an article, um, which uh, is in Society of Natural Resources, if people are interested. Um, so another one looking at uh, wind farm ownership in uh, South Dakota and Minnesota. Um, this was, um, uh, my previous institution before I was at Ohio State, I was four years at uh, South Dakota State University in Brookings, and there's all sorts of wind development going on around there. Um, and it was 
interesting because there is sort of a diversity of different ownership structures for, uh, for the wind farms. Uh, we had uh, big multinational co companies coming in. We had municipally owned wind farms. We had electrical cooperatives. We had community owned wind farms. And, um, you know, trying to, it sort of offered this uh, natural almost experiment to look at how this ownership um, structures might be affecting uh, the impacts on the community and the ways that people sort of think about um, these, these energy developments and attitudes towards um, the wind farms. So we did uh, some, this is qualitative research, did some interviews in uh, these four places in sort of the greater uh, Brookings, South Dakota region. Um, I guess here's, here's Brookings right there. Um, but um, lots of wind, I guess the arrow's pointing to towards the Twin Cities there to sort of orientate you where you are. Um, there was uh, the Washington Springs and the Prairie Winds Wind Farms. Um, so this, this one right here was, uh, is um, built by Next Era, um, sort of a large corporation. Um, and then this one here is, is owned by the Basin Electric uh, Cooperative, which is a really large electrical cooperative, uh, mostly in the Great Plains in the West. Um, and then in Minnesota, there's a municipally owned wind farm. So this wind, these turbines were owned by this, uh, the Minnesota Municipal Power Authority, which is this, I guess, coalition of munis municipalities that have like purchasing agreements. What's uh, interesting and ironic about this is that Blooming Prairie, which is the, the town nearby, is not part of the municipal, Minnesota Municipal Power Authority. So um, of all the places they could have cited the turbine, this, turbines, they cited the wind farm um, next to a town that wasn't part of the Municipal Power Authority. Um, but it's one of the, if not the largest, uh, municipally owned wind projects in the United States. Um, and then we had uh, the city of Lake Benton, um, a bunch of wind turbines that were first built by Enron in uh, the early 90s. Um, and it was one of the first um, wind, wind farms ever built, modern wind farms of, you know, the, sort of the modern construction style. Uh, they had, um, you know, lots of sort of wind tourists and they had uh, wind, wind farm days uh, as sort of the town festival. They have a museum in the town hall. Um, it was, you know, it's really sort of become part of their identity uh, in Lake Benton. Um, and so they've, there's, in the Buffalo Ridge wind farm, there's 125 wind turbines, and then there's a couple of other wind farms that have been built uh, since then. Um, and so we have this, this corporate ownership of all these turbines. And then there's this other project, which was actually a community owned wind farm, uh, where 120 local residents pooled their money together to buy uh, 12 2.5 megawatt turbines, uh, which is, is fairly unprecedented. Uh, I think there's only a couple of cases of this in the country. Um, so our, our methods, we, uh, we're doing interviews, um, looking at sort of what people know about the ownership structures, how much the ownership structure seemed to make, to influence the impacts to the community during the development process. How does it seem to impact people's attitudes towards wind energy? Um, using uh, this paper on biofuels uh, by Carmen Bain sort of uh, as, the, as the framework for our research project. Um, did 32 interviews in these communities, uh, basically 10 or a dozen in each one of the towns. Um, basically, uh, the summary of our findings is that the ownership structure didn't matter at all. Um, people, people had no idea who owned the wind farm really. Or they might they might know you know Basin Electric you know where are they headquartered uh, I'm not really sure, um, and um, you know the ownership you know structure of the wind 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 farms um, you know basically were perceived as sort of non-local actors coming into the community building the wind farm and then leaving. Uh, most of the employees, the people doing the maintenance, were sort of regional. They weren't located. Um, you know, near the town, the, they didn't know who the employees were. They didn't really have any interaction with the with the employees, um, and so it was just basically, you know, someone else built that in our town. Um, you know, and they're they're not from here. They're not part of the community. Um, and you know, I think that's it's interesting with the wind wind energy industry. Um, it does tend to be pretty regional. 
um, or, or even national when you're talking about the employees. Um, it's unlikely that um, even if you have a wind farm in your community that you know folks are necessarily going to be sort of local members uh, just because you know the maintenance crews, the, the um, production crews tend to be regional. Um, and so in the cooperative municipal corporate um, People just saw them sort of as outsiders in the community, except for um, Community Wind North, which was the community-owned wind farm. Um, and this was sort of, pe people saw this completely differently. Um, and uh, so the process that they went through to get this community wind farm is, uh, would take a long time to explain, but basically they put together this board of directors, they applied for money, they um, negotiated a power purchase agreement with the, uh, with the transmission line company, um, is really savvy um, folks um, that had put this together. T tons of social capital, um, tons of, I guess, uh, human capital in terms of just the, the ability to negotiate um, and to work through this project. Um, so they have this board of directors and they um, have public meetings, they have a newsletter, um, but they also had um, 150 um, local residents. I think it was. 120, but um, either way, it's a, that's a lot, especially for a small town. Um, and they each invested $23,000 a piece. Um, and so they, each of these 120 local residents had to put $8,000 um, up front, which was 100% at risk uh, during certain parts of the project. And they knew it was at risk, uh, whereas if the project failed, they lost their money. Um, and then they had to put an additional $15,000 in a CD that um, wasn't at risk where if the project failed they'd get the money back. Um, but this in and of itself is really astonishing to me. Um, you know, heard stories of people like cashing out their retirement funds, you know, borrowing money from, from uh, family members, selling businesses to, to um, you know, selling equipment to get the money to, to basically buy into this uh, community-owned wind farm. And so they partnered with uh, Edison Renewable Energy, which is um, a large energy company um, and this was important because the renewable uh, Edison could get the tax credit the production tax credit uh, basically in exchange for putting up money um, to sort of uh, um, raise the funds needed to buy these wind turbines because even though these res residents in, um, put up all this 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 money it's still not nearly enough funds to uh, to buy 12 2.5 megawatt wind turbines so the project, the structure of it's really complicated, but Edison owns 99% of the project for the first 10 years. And then after that, the ownership switches. So Edison owns 20% and then the, the investors own 80%. Um, and so, but even after, after in these first 10 years, 1% ownership has been meaning between two and 4,000 a year for these local investors. Um, I think by now they've pretty much made their money back. Um, and still have you know, 20 or 30 years left of production. Um, and so once that ownership uh, flips, then uh, presumably the, the amount of money um, that they'll receive will, off, will go up pretty substantially. Um, there's lots of other considerations like the insurance on a wind turbine after 10 years also goes up a lot. And there's maintenance costs and um, all sorts of sort of complicating mitigating factors, but uh, it's an interesting model. Um, and so, uh, you know, doing interviews with folks there, um, people really felt like they, even if they weren't members of this group, they felt like they owned this thing. Like this was a community owned project. Our friends own this wind farm, our, you know, the, the commu community owns this wind farm. And a lot of it, you know, is probably driven by place, driven by the fact that Enron had been building turbines in the 90s, that this is, you know, they have this really long history of wind, wind energy. Um, it must be, must be a good investment if these companies keep coming here to, to build more of them. And, you know, s how many places where could this uh, project have happened? I'm not sure. Uh, just because, you know, that 20 years of history really seemed to make a difference. Um, and so, the, you know, the benefits of this community ownership. Um, so, you know, these investors are getting profits. Um, uh, plus the landowners where those 12 turbines are sited are also getting their, their lease payments royalties. Um, and so, you know, significant, you know, uh, money that's being returned to the community through this ownership 
But also um, people perceived, you know, real local accountability. They perceived local access. You know, if we have any problems with the turbines, we could just call the board of directors. I got his number right here. Uh, they always return our calls. Um, you know, I see, I see the president of the board of directors at the you know, grocery store. Um, I run into him all the time. Um, everyone, you know, sort of knows each other and they feel like um, that the, you know, the board of directors are very responsive to any concerns there might be. Uh, we saw some anecdotal evidence of this, you know, like there's a bed and breakfast owner who one of the crews of electricians were, uh, they were sort of remiss in paying their, their bill for the bed and breakfast. So one call to the board of directors, you know, seemed to solve all that uh, immediately. And there's a couple other sort of where someone was uh, reimbursed uh, one of the landowners had a wind turbine that was community owned and he also had some corporately owned wind turbines on his property and in terms of getting reimbursed for damages um, he said that the community owned wind farm was was really responsive um, <clears throat> so i guess you know conclusions from this project was that uh, wind farm ownership didn't really seem to matter um, and you know in rural sociology in sort of rural uh, public policy, you know, people really been thinking about uh, the ownership of, of agriculture in the United States and sort of the structure, the scale of agriculture that you see a lot of really large agricultural operations that tend to be owned and operated by sort of outsiders of the community. Um, and that perhaps, you know, this wind farm ownership is, is sort of continuing this trend. Um, the community owned wind farms project seems to be a, a really big success, however, how often that can be um, duplicated, just given the, the complexity of what they went through to get this thing um, uh, built over you know, ten, a 10 year timeline with uh, multiple, you know, the, just the negotiations they went through with Edison Energy, with the, the power purchase agreement, with all these, with the state regulators. Um, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing that it was built um, and seems to have uh, you know, positive impacts. Okay, so last uh, research project. So this is sort of uh, picking up off of this, um, this idea that these wind farms tend to be you know, built by outsiders um, and maybe exacerbating these, these trends in sort of uh, agricultural ownership in the United States. Um, uh, my PhD student, Josh Fergan, and I decided to take a look at sort of these more macro um, level sort of uh, I guess the, you know, the dispersion of wind turbines across the country, where are they located? What can we say about the places where they're located? So um, we started uh, looking at some, some data from the census of, of agriculture, the USDA census, egg census, um, which has lots of interesting data on agricultural operations. Um, and so um, we pulled up a map. And so this is a map of uh, average farm size and wind turbine locations in the US, which was the first map that we'd sort of just, just did a spatial overlay. And it's like, wow, um, they sort of like, you know, there doesn't seem to be a random distribution here. Um, you know, isn't that interesting? So the, the, the redder the counties, the, the biggest, or the bigger the average fa uh, farm size in acres. Um, and the greener the counties are the smaller average farm size. Um, so this is research that we're still doing uh, now, still running some um, analysis. Hopefully we'll get this paper submitted this spring sometime um, to get a sneak peek of, of this project. Um, so I think what we, what we did is just, um, we're you know, looking at counties that had wind turbines with, and counties that didn't. So the blue one, blue counties are counties that have a wind turbine. And then we did, um, and I sh wish Josh was here to explain this, we did a, basically a, um, a cluster analysis and there was three, three or four clusters in the United States where um, the, the geographic distribution of the turbines um, tended to be clustered in a way that um, couldn't be explained by chance and is uh, statistically significant um, in these areas where um, there just seems to be a disproportionately large number of wind turbines, um, which we don't really know. We, um, can't explain that uh, precisely at this point. Um, one of the first things we were interested in was what's the correlation between wind turbines and wind? Um, it turns out that there is a correlation between wind turbines and wind resource. Um, however, it doesn't 
you know, necessarily look like that's totally what's going on. I mean, obviously there's huge areas of the United States that are very windy that have no wind turbines. Um, and there's, you know, lots of different factors here. There's, you know, transmission line access, there's proximity to, to urban areas, to consumers. Um, but there's also seems to be these weird patterns or, or clumps. Um, and so, and then the high, high counties, these are these, are these sort of, uh, these, these um, statistically significant groups of turbines. Um, the correlation between wind actually drops quite a bit if you're looking at just those, those, those areas. Um, so just running some correlations between, um, between number of turbines um, and, and some of these uh, characteristic variables from, uh, from the ag census. So, this, so the county is the unit of analysis here. Um, so a county that has the more turbines they have um, tends to be a higher size in acres, um, tends to be more operation income. I think I have them highlighted here. Um, um, higher percentage of agricultural operators live off of the farm. Um, higher percentage of tenant farmers um, uh, tend to be larger farms with larger income. Um, tend to have more turbines at the county level. Um, <clears throat> we're still sort of figuring out what these might mean necessarily. So if you guys have good ideas, let me know. Um, it, um, but, you know, these maps are really interesting. Um, so this is, uh, you know, percent farms operated by tenants, which means that the owner of the land doesn't do the actual operations of the agriculture. They, they rent the land out to someone else. Um, you know, some of these areas, it just, they seem to like sort of fit like a glove in there, um, or these counties uh, tend to have high percentage of, of tenants. And there's a statistical correlation, and, and the correlation goes up when you, when you focus in on uh, those, those high, high counties. Um, <clears throat> uh, farms that live off, uh, principal operators who live off the farm, which means the people doing the ag, um, Operations don't live nearby. Um, you also see some some interesting spatial correlations. Um, average farm size. Um, again, it's it's interesting. It's, it seems to to align pretty pretty well spatially. Um, although the correlation drops if you look at um, just high high counties. Um, and then uh, average um, uh, operation income. Again, I mean, there's, it, it's, it's interesting. It's, you know, it's in a sea of blue around here. There's just a few red counties and those happen to be the counties where there's lots of wind, wind farms um, in, a, in a bunch of these areas, although that's not the case here. Um, you know, what does this all mean exactly? Not, not sure, um, but it's, you know, it seems to, to point towards, um, Wind turbines seem to be attracted to places where there's large farms with, with uh, um, off-farm operators. Um, and um, if you look back at the table, you know, the, if uh, there's a negative correlation with, uh, with small farms with uh, sort of low levels of income. Um, if you're a full owner operator, you have a negative correlation with wind development. Um, so uh, it seems like wind turbines are, are attracted to places where, where the operator doesn't live there um, and where they're renting the land out to agricultural operations and where there's lots of uh, income off the farm. Um, okay, so a few concluding remarks. Um, you know, the pri private land ownership is a driving force shaping energy development in the United States. The uh, United States is really unique in that it, the mineral rights uh, system that the U.S. has is pretty much um, pretty unique other than, you know, Canada in that uh, the landowners own the mineral rights, uh, the landowners own the wind rights, um, and that's, um, you know, a sort of a, an interesting regulatory tool uh, that's shaping um, energy development in the U.S., either, um, you know, uh, incentivizing or limiting it. Um, you know, public policy in, is shaping how private land ownership can regulate this. Um, 
you know, public policy to a good, good extent is limiting public participation uh, opportunities. It's incentivizing this private participation. Um, it's sort of strengthening the private land, uh, landowner's rights. Um, and when it comes to wind energy, it's really incentivizing corporate ownership and these sort of large, large outside owners. Um, private land ownership offers new forms of participation in energy siting. Um, there's this opportunity for more societal benefits from energy um, because through this sort of private participation, um, seems to give people more trust. Um, more benefits to landowners seem to accrue. Um, there's this potential for more benefits to the community. So you have landowners that can say no. You have landowners that can say, well, uh, we'll let you do this, but we want this in return. Whether they actually say that is another question, but there's at least the potential. There's this a mechanism for which um, landowners can sort of get con concessions from energy. Uh, but there's all sorts of potential societal costs uh, from this private participation model. Um, you have lots of people who, who do not qualify to participate uh, because they don't own land or they don't have land that's suitable for de de development. Um, it may be sort of exacerbating this gap between have, haves and have-nots in these communities where the landowners who um, I think usually are sort of considered to be among the elites in a, in a community. Uh, the landowners are the ones that are participating, who are sort of holding the, uh, the purse strings, if you will. Um, whereas people who rent, people who live in town, people um, who have small acreages or don't own their mineral rights, um, you know, they sort of lose out under this scenario. Um, so I guess this is um, just some of the research I've been up to, some of the things I've been thinking about when it comes to sort of landowners and um, sort of the regulation of energy development. Um, so I've been talking for a long time. Um, love to take uh, questions that you might have or um, comments or ideas that might explain these, uh, these maps of agricultural operations and turbine locations. So any questions?